Hello everyone and welcome to part four of our textbook known as Is Knowledge Gendered? So um, just so you know this lecture is going to give us a brief introduction into what epistemology is in philosophy since we'll need that sort of understanding to really gauge what the feminist criticisms are targeting. So we're going to have a brief introduction to epistemology and then go over some of the more complicated aspects of this week's reading, primarily focusing on the difference between atomistic and situated knowers, and then getting a very clear understanding of uh, standpoint theory and its unique approach as compared to the traditional approaches to knowledge. So epistemology in philosophy is the study of knowledge and justified belief. So what this means specifically is focusing on different types of knowledge, right? There, uh, the idea here is that there are different ways of knowing things, primarily two different ways of knowing things. We have uh, categories of procedural knowledge, knowing how to do something or being able to identify who someone is. These are not so much the focus of philosophy since they have um, other more biological explanations and not purely um, things that have to do with mental cognition. Uh, so the idea of being able to know how to do something, you've probably heard of like muscle memory, um, and the fact that we're even learning now that our cells are able to sort of memorize things, that's, that's how they do a lot of what they're able to do to, you know, to build up our immune systems. Same thing with um, being able to identify who someone is. This can uh, be impaired by a lot of other physical aspects. Um, I forget what it's called, but there's uh, something where you're not able to recognize faces, um, things like this. So these are not the types of knowledge that philosophers are concerned with, again, because they have primarily biological explanations. And so we can uh, defer to other disciplines to give us answers to those. What we are concerned with in philosophy is propositional knowledge knowing that something is the case. So that is knowledge that has to do with declarative statements, right? Declaring that something is or is not the case and or descriptive statements, right? So if someone were to explain how you know something, right? In terms of muscle memory or cellular memory, the how, the answer to the how question would be something philosophers were concerned with, right? So if you say, well, the reason that we know how to drive a car, even when we've been, you know, spacing out for the last hour, and <laughs> I don't know if any of you have done that, but I certainly have, right? You might think like, oh my gosh, how did I not crash the car? It's almost like your body's able to take over, right? Or, um, you know, sports players talking about like being in the zone, right? You don't have to give it much mental energy. So if we were to give an answer to how you know that, we would be answering that how question which philosophers don't really care about, with a descriptive or declarative statement, which philosophers are concerned with, right? So if we say that you're able to memorize those things because your cells are able to, um, you know, reproduce in various patterns, which is something like memory, right? Being able to copy that instance over and over again, we would say, okay, well, how can we verify? How do you know that the cells are doing that, right? And so we philosophy would be concerned with the descriptive statements there. Right, so looking at what would count as sufficient evidence in science, right, uh, whether or not that's been, re uh, you know, repetitive, right, able to repeat through the scientific method. So that sort of distinction, knowing that something is the case. So in this sense, right, we still have a lot to discuss of what knowledge is. So we want to talk about the nature of knowledge. Um, this has been something that's taken up philosophical debate since the very origins of the tradition and probably even before that, right? What does it actually mean to know something? How is that different from say, just believing it to be true? So for example, if I were to, um, you know, look at someone and say, I believe this person has 75 cents in their pocket, right? What's the difference between me just believing that that's the case and me actually knowing that that's the case? And so throughout the history of philosophy, we have gotten, we have arrived at a somewhat widely accepted definition up until the 1960s. So this was the prevailing understanding of what knowledge was up until just a few decades ago. So justified true belief is the idea that to know something, you have to meet three conditions. You have to believe it, belief in this case being a propositional attitude, right? So if we have the proposition, you have 75 cents in your pocket, 
right? I would take an attitude towards that as being either true or false, right? And so my propositional attitude basically constitutes my belief. So you can't believe something unless you, unless you actually take a position on its being true or false. So that's the idea there. So you have to first believe it. Okay, so I, I say, yes, I believe you have 75 cents in your pocket. Well, believing it is not going to be sufficient for me to know it. There has to be something else. And the most obvious candidate seems to be that, well, that belief has to actually be true in the world, right? I can't say that I know you have 75 cents in your pocket if it turns out that you don't, in fact, have 75 cents in your pocket. Whereas it does make sense for me to say, well, I believed it, but it turns out I was wrong. Okay, so we have to first believe a proposition, then it actually has to be true in the world, right? And so here we're taking um, a sort of objective understanding of truth, right? Something that could theoretically be verified, although that doesn't rule out the idea that, you know, maybe it's true and you just don't know it. And that brings up lots of fun issues in epistemology, like, yeah, but do you know that you know that they, you're right, like in that Friends episode. <laughs> so we can always, you know, talk about knowing that we know something. That's, that's, that's some upper level stuff. <laughs> but here we're just saying, okay, it has to be something you believe and it has to actually be true in the world. But that in and of itself doesn't seem to be enough, right? Lots of people believe things that just turn out to be true but we might say that the fact that they were true is not so much because they knew it, but maybe they were lucky, right? So let's say, okay, I think you have 75 cents in your pocket and you say, well, why do you think that? And I say, well, because I had a dream that I would see someone today who had 75 cents in their pocket. You might think, well, you know, I actually do have 75 cents in my pocket, but I don't think you really knew that. I think you more had a lucky guess. Right? And so this introduces the third criteria, which is justification. It's not just enough to believe something and for that belief to be true. You have to have not just reasons for thinking that it was true, but good reasons, right? So in this case, you know, when I'm talking about knowing an, an empirical proposition, well, having a dream about it might not seem like a good enough reason for it to be knowledge, okay? So this brings up, again, um, a sort of broad definition that has been used throughout most of human history. But that was up until the 1960s, like I said, when a very famous um, philosopher who was made famous by a two-page paper, so if you think you have to like be able to write a lot to do important work, he's the counterexample, two-page paper that totally undercut this definition of philosophy that had been used for thousands of years. And the basic idea is comes from Edmund Gettier, and it's known as, of course, the Gettier problem. And the idea here is that this in and of itself doesn't seem to be enough because there are lots of things that would count as a justified true belief that wouldn't count as knowledge. So for example, um, there are some issues with implication and logic, right? So if you have, you know, one belief, the idea is that based on what that belief is composed of, you're, it's gonna imply or entail that you have other beliefs as well. So for example, if you are going to work and you see that your coworker has, uh, drives, um, I don't know, a blue Chevy, and then that would imply, right, that you also believe that your coworker drives a blue Chevy, right? Because that person is your coworker, right? So the idea is that our beliefs come in webs, right? They imply a lot of other things. And so the problem is that we might be justified in believing one proposition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're justified in believing a proposition that it's entailed by it. And since that justification doesn't transfer, knowledge wouldn't transfer either. And so there has to be something else besides justification to count as this. So the idea is, let's say you go to work one day and you have, you know, one coworker, Susie, she drives a blue Chevy, but you arrive at work one day and you f see that there's actually a red, I don't know, Honda in, in the parking lot. Okay, well, now you think that Susie, so I forgot what I gave her, her made up name. You think that Susie dropped, bought a new car, that Susie bought a red Honda. Well, it turns out that you're wrong. Susie didn't buy a red Honda, but one of your other coworkers, Tommy, bought a red Honda. But the problem is with the traditional notion of justified true belief, that would say that you knew that Tommy 
bought a new car because you knew that your coworker bought a new car. So the idea is, okay, Susie and Tommy are both your coworkers. So if Susie bought a new car, then you also believed that your coworker bought a new car, right? But Timmy also counts as one of your coworkers. So that makes it seem like you knew that Timmy had bought a new car, which you obviously didn't, right? Because you got the coworker incorrect. So this is just one example of how the notion of justified true belief is maybe not sufficient to give us an account of what knowledge is. And so in response to that, epistemology today is really a big response to this problem. Like what can we add to this criteria to make sure that we're capturing knowing something rather than just believing it. And you might think, well, why is that so important? Well, knowledge holds a special status for us in life, right? Knowing something is a sign of your being an expert or an authority figure on that matter, right? And so carries a lot of weight, not just in, you know, how we live our everyday lives, but also in who we're going to listen to to gain new beliefs and new knowledge, right? And so in addition to talking about what knowledge is, Another big area of epistemology is discussing the scope of knowledge, right? Exactly how much can we know, right? Is it possible in theory to know everything? Or are there potentially things that even if they were true, we might never be able to know them, right? So maybe you think, well, yeah, there could be alien life out there in the world. I just don't think that, you know, with the human capacity for knowledge, we'll ever be able to come to know that, right? In theory, we could if the evidence presented itself, right? Or humans were able to advance to a certain degree, but I just maybe don't think that's possible. And so we'll never know. You could also take this position on the existence of God, right? You could be agnostic and just say, well, it's not that I don't, I just don't know whether or not God exists yet. I don't think that's ever something a human being could know, right? Perhaps it's just too, too infinite, right? Too beyond the scope of what the human brain is able to imagine, right? Or to cognize or to make sense of. And so in this regard, if you think there is a limitation on what we can know, then you are some type of skeptic, right? So skepticism is a term in philosophy, specifically epistemology, when one takes the position that there are at least some things we cannot know. So that's the um, moderate version of skepticism, right? Saying that there are some things we can know, but there are some things that we can't. And then there's a uh, you know, lot of disagreement on what it is that we can't know. And that comes primarily from David Hume as a mitigated skeptic, as well as some just um, hypothetical uh, questions about you know, questioning the external world which we get a little bit from Descartes is in academic skepticism, right? So like the idea is maybe we can't trans trust our senses, right? Maybe we're in, um, you know, a hologram as some people have theorized, right? Or the idea is no, we can only trust our senses and we can't trust anything else, okay? So those, we're gonna talk a little bit more about those. But the other idea is that, well, maybe it's more than just some things we can't know. In fact, maybe we can't know anything at all. This is known as Peronian skepticism, right? So it would be the most radical view. And it basically goes on the idea that, yeah, you can't trust your senses, but you also can't trust your reason as well because we are so easily um, confused, right? And mistaken about things. Uh, I'm not sure how these guys got out of bed in the morning, right? <laughs> but the idea was that you can't know anything at all. So different degrees of skepticism, but they all have to do with thinking that there is at least some things that we cannot know. They're beyond our capability. All right, so that leads us to the primary views or what I like to call camps in epistemology throughout the history. And these are important to understand because even though there's a variety of them, as we're going to see, they're all going to have some things in common, and perhaps you can already guess why, if you take a look at the, these photographs, right, these paintings, is that all of these theories were produced by very privileged, right, wealthy, white men, okay? And so the idea here is that feminists are going to look back at these theories and say that all of them are problematic because they're all going to be underscored by this bias right, that is going to come not just from those individual men, but the societies in which they lived, right, which were patriarchal, right, misogynistic in the ways that we've been learning about, right. So the idea is not just whether or not them as individuals were biased, but perhaps their ideas are problematic because they were 
developed within a flawed system, right? So that that sort of systemic problem actually impacts the views themselves and not just the personal opinions of these individuals. Okay, and so this has to do primarily with these theories or camps have to do with a disagreement about where knowledge comes from, right? So if we go back to justified true belief, right? The idea is where do we get that justification, right? Where does it come from, right? That will give us knowledge. And so there are, again, two main camps or splits along, uh, you know, views in response to this question. The first one is comes from a view known as rationalism. And this is the idea that knowledge, right? Specifically propositional knowledge, does not come from the outside world, but instead comes from something internal to us or innate, something that we are born with. And this specifically has been tied to notions of the mind, which is uh, sometimes referred to in the history of philosophy as the soul, because a lot of um, philosophers thought that the soul was actually the part of your being that was able to engage in reason and rationality. And so the mind and the soul were sort of tied together. Now, more contemporary views, you know, would distinguish like the brain from the soul. So that's not what the rationalists are talking about. When they talk about your mind, they're not talking about your brain. They're talking some, maybe something in terms of like what we would now call consciousness, right? That sort of thing that is able to think and to engage in ideas, right? And form thoughts and perhaps the basis of your personality, right? So that's sort of what they're talking about here. And the idea with rationalism is that knowledge can't come from experience because our experience is always changing and differing and um, in fact leading us to make mistakes. That true knowledge can only come from our souls or our minds because those things are able to engage in reason and discover absolute truths, right? True, so truth in the sense being s such an extreme objective thing that it never changes. And so if I form a belief about, you know, the table sitting in front of me, that might be true for the time being, right? If I think this table is brown, but eventually the table won't be brown, right? Because experience in the physical world is going to involve you know, decay. And so this table will not be brown forever. And also this table hasn't been brown for the entire history, right? There was a time at which this table didn't exist or when it was being constructed when it wasn't brown. So that's not a big T truth, so to speak, right? That's just, a, it's true temporarily in the physical world. And so because truths in the physical world are always only temporarily true, that can't count as knowledge. It needs to be something else, right? So in this case, mathematical truths, right, would count as knowledge. Two plus two will always equal four, right? No matter what. A triangle will always be composed, right, of three internal angles, which equal 180 degrees, right? So these, these types of truths, which can never change. And so the only explanation for how you could know those things right, is going to be tied to a religious conception of the soul because it will often have to do with, you know, those truths existing somewhere beyond the physical plane, which your body can't travel to. And so we have historically understood the soul as being the only thing that could access, right, wherever these truths exist, right? So these are rationalists. And they think, again, right, that all truths, in this case, can't come from experience. And so the term for what rationalists think we can get knowledge from is a priori, right? So the types of truths that can lead to knowledge are a priori truths. A priori coming from the Latin here, so you can see prior, so this means from the earlier, but specifically prior to experience, okay? So a rationalist thinks that the only kind of proposition that could possibly become knowledge is an a priori truth, right? So like I said before, two plus two equals four that's going to be true prior to you experiencing anything in the world, right? All you have to do is understand what two is, what addition is, and what four is, right? That just by that definition alone, right, you can understand that that proposition, two plus two equals four, is true. Another example would be all bachelors are unmarried men. This is considered an a priori truth because it's just true because of what it means to be a bachelor. Right? You don't actually have to go out into the world and check all the bachelors to make sure they're unmarried to know that that statement is true, right? It's true prior to you experiencing anything in the world, okay? So that's what rationalists think 
knowledge can come from. So anything that comes from experience, according to rationalism, is going to at least start as something less than knowledge, right? Maybe just a true belief, okay? Um, and it would need something else to be count as knowledge. Empiricism, on the other hand, is going to take the opposite stance. That, in fact, the only thing we can trust is our experience. And so all knowledge will require experience, that they are going to deny that there is any such thing as an a priori truth. Nothing is true, according to the empiricist, before we can experience it in the world, right? This is even true for the idea of, um, you know, uh, imagined qualities. So if I ask you all to picture a gold mountain, right? You might say, well, oh, I can do that even though I've never experienced a gold mountain. So rationalism must be true. Well, an empiricist would say, no, you're only able to picture a gold mountain because you've experienced mountains and because you've experienced gold and your mind is just such a complex mechanism that it's able to combine those things together, right, in your imagination. So the idea here is that all knowledge requires experience and as such only a posteriori truths can lead to knowledge, right? So post here, again, being the root of the Latin for from the later, right? So this is a posteriori truths come after experience, right? Later then, whereas a priori truths, right? You can know prior to experience. Okay, and the final sort of um, approach to epistemology is something we get from Immanuel Kant, who tried to take a position that knowledge requires both a priori concepts and a posteriori experiences. So his idea was that neither one of them is sufficient on their own, that you have to have both in presence for knowledge to occur. Okay, so these are the main views uh, that have been dominant in epistemology. There are lots of different types, of course, under these different labels or camps, but these are the three big ones. And again, the idea here is that they will share an underlying presumption that is gendered about reason, rationality, justification, knowledge, right, all of these things, even objective truth, those are all going to be understood now to be gendered in a way that is biased against notions of femininity, which have thus denied, historically, women from occupying positions of expertise, right, for not being considered people who know lots of things. Right? So the idea is that women have been denied the recognition or acknowledgement of knowledge because these theories have this implicit bias working through them. Okay, So that's the overall goal that feminists are going to be trying to uh, demonstrate and that we'll see this week. And then we'll see in the following week how this applies to certain areas of knowledge like the STEM fields, right, science, technology, engineering, math, and why those have been so male dominated. Right, The idea is that women are thus end up they end up being prohibited from entering those occupations and those fields and those disciplines precisely because we have been socialized to sort of accept this implicit understanding of what it means to know something in a biased way all right so the primary issue here as i mentioned is going to be the associate or the um, issue surrounding what it means to be reasonable or rational as you can see that that underlies a lot of our understandings of justification and thus our understanding of knowledge. And so the idea here is that there are, again, probably different ways of understanding rationality, but we understand this basically as being logically consistent, right, in our derivations of one proposition from another, right? So the idea here is we're looking for some sort of consistency, logic, or rules when engaging in inference, right? Moving from, say, premises to a conclusion, moving from, you know, observing a set of facts to making uh, some sort of generalization about the world, right? So when we engage in that intellectual thought, right, the idea is that we're being consistent in some way, and that's how we've generally understood rationality. But again, this takes on special meaning in epistemology because that notion of rationality is then going to be used to distinguish holding just a mere true belief from potentially actually knowing something to be true, right? So in this case, rationality can be very instrumental. It's, it's something that we use 
to make important decisions, and especially, as we'll see in the world and in science in particular, to achieve goals, right? So knowledge is not just something that, you know, is valuable in and of itself, although we hope, of course, that we think that that's the case. <laughs> but it's valuable because it, it gets us things, right? It's, it's the reason that we're able to advance as a society, right, um, in our in our technology, right, and in our ability to sustain life on this planet, hopefully, right, rather than destroy it. But the idea is we're able to achieve certain goals, right, by using the knowledge that we have. And so, again, we want to acknowledge how some agents, right, epistemic agents, people who can know things, maybe have been bounded, right, or restrained from being attributed with rationality, right? Why is it that some people are just presumed to be less intelligent than others? Why is it that people might just defer to one gender over another, one race over another, one socioeconomic status over another as just inherently being smarter, right? Or more capable of achieving knowledge, right? And as we're gonna understand, this is going to lead to notions of ecological rationality, right, where we see the permeation of these biases work all the way up through our models even of the economics, right? So if you study economics, right, you're trying to study um, theories or models of how people actually behave, but you'll notice that every economic model assumes what they call a rational agent, right? They assume that people engaging in economic decisions are always acting rationally, meaning that they're always acting in their own best interests and or the interests of others. But as we'll understand, first off, if you've just existed in the world, you know that people don't always behave rationally, right? But that even our understanding of what makes someone rational could be flawed, right? So we see that this, these ideas are going to work their way up throughout various aspects of our world and just impact lots of different things. Okay, so the basic issue that we'll see in these conceptions of rationality as they have been traditionally developed is that they have been distinguished from and set up in opposition to emotion, right? So the idea here is that we have defined rationality as being unemotional, right? Emotion is thus set up as something that is inherently irrational. And so because these are set up as a disjunction, right, an either or, the idea is that you can only be engaging in one of those states at a time. You can either be rational or you can be emotional. The idea is that you cannot be both. And of course, as we've probably already guessed or understood or are projecting, these are inherently gendered ideas, right? We very clearly associate rationality with one gender over another and more specifically with one type of masculinity, specifically white upper class masculinity, and with emotion or being irrational with marginalized groups, right? So women, individuals of color, right? People in lower socioeconomic statuses, they are thus inherently boxed in to this other status now as it relates to what they can know. Okay, so what we first have to understand here is what an emotion is, because as is uh, rightly pointed out by some of our authors, the basic reason that rationality has been set up in opposition to emotion is because we don't, we haven't really understood what emotions are, right? The way we learn about emotions is that, yeah, you know, your brain, your uh, brain produces beliefs and emotion happens somewhere else in your body, right? Maybe it's the gut, maybe it's the heart right, something else, but the idea is that it's a bodily expression and not a mental or cognitive expression. And hopefully for anyone who has a basic understanding of cognitive psychology and biology, you know that that's not true, right? So you don't have emotional responses in your body or in your mind for no reason, right? There's always going to be a cause to the effect of you having an emotional response. Now, sometimes that could be a biological effect in, in the terms of like a chemical imbalance, right? But here we're talking about emotional, emotional states that have as their origin, not just a biological mechanism, which again, that still happens in the brain, but in the sense that it is the product of a belief, right? So you feel sad because you are thinking about something sad. 
right? You feel happy because you are thinking about something happy, right? You are angry because of something, right? Something happened to make one angry. And so this needs to be clarified, right, from other previous definitions of emotion. So the dictionary de definition is a natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, or relationships with others. So here, the inclusion of words like natural and instinctive are those words that are going to hint at this definition being tied to one's physical body rather than one's mental cognition, right? That emotions are purely the product of something that you are born with, right? That sort of innate instinctive status. Martha Nussbaum is going to give us a different sort of definition here. She's going to define emotions as intelligent appraisals of a world that we do not control in the light of our own significant goals and plans, right? So the idea is that the reason you have emotional responses to things is first of all, because you are able to intellectualize them, right? You can't respond to something in the world emotionally if you don't have a concept in some sense of what it is, right? There has to be some thought in your mind, even if you're not able to, you know, put the words to it and don't have the language or don't understand exactly what it is, you're registering something in the world as happening, right? There is a conscious mind engaging in, with the world, right? Unconscious minds don't have emotions, <laughs> okay? So the idea is that it's a, it's a conscious interaction with the world and typically involves, as she's saying, right, the fact that elements outside of our bodies are, and even sometimes inside our bodies, are not within our control, right? So the idea is that there's something happening that you can't affect, and that is generating in you a response, right? Typically that will be, of course, determined by what you wish was the case, right? These are your goals and plans, right? So you want something to happen, it either does or doesn't happen in the world, that intersection, right, and a conscious mind observing that is what generates an emotional response, right? So it's always going to involve cognition, right? So emotion here is being taken out of something that happens simply uncontrollably in your body, right? As if it's you know, like a disease that you can't control, right? <laughs> or an organ that exists somewhere else, right? It's not something that's outside of our control, the emotions in a sense, right? But is in instead a response to something that is outside of our control. So her idea here is that once we understand the complex intelligence of emotions, we will also have new reasons to value their work in other arenas, right? So by recognizing that emotions need not be at odds with rationality, right? That being emotional doesn't mean you're being irrational, then we open up the possibility that emotions can play a role in intellectual pursuits. Right? And as we'll also see, uh, especially highlighted next week, that's already the case, right? We already have emotions present in very high levels of, you know, trying to seek knowledge, like in science, right? Emotions are always present in science. You don't see, you know, people going after their PhD, you know, uh, going on to get a doctor, or getting their doctorate. Um, going on to, you know, spend years as interns, right, or doing some sort of field training, and then, you know, decades of research, you don't see someone dedicate that much of their life to something they're not passionate about, right? There's always going to be emotion involved in the pursuits of what we want to know, okay? So it's not only going to recognize that emotion's already present in those fields, but will in theory actually create space for those emotions to play a role in a positive way, right? So even when they're present, we don't need to think of them as threatening knowledge in some way. That emotion can actually be used perhaps in conjunction with other traditional notions of rational, or uh, other as aspects of rationality, right? That they can work in tandem together and it can actually better help us achieve knowledge. And so I, I think the best way to understand this is um, perhaps maybe in terms of um, maybe the way you encounter art, right? Uh, music, paintings, a piece of literature, poetry, right? Whatever it is, um, imagine a piece of art that maybe at one point didn't speak to you, you know, where you're like, kind of like, oh, okay, this kind of is cool, I guess. But then after you had some very 
emotionally powerful experience in your life, you were able to appreciate that art in a new way, right? That you quote unquote understood it better, right? That your understanding, your knowledge of that thing was actually deepened because of an emotional state that you had experienced, right? Or this is, you could also understand this in the same way of, of empathy, right? That you are babe, better able to understand the experience of others when there is an emotional connection that you can establish there, right, between you, that there is a feeling that goes along with your propositional attitudes that can actually help you know things better, okay? So it's going to destigmatize the role of emotions in fields of knowledge since they're already there anyways, and give us a way for us to account for the role of emotion in a positive way as actually being a tool that we can use to better know the world. Right, so this is gonna be important for all kinds of reasons, but obviously more so as it correlates to power dynamics, right? So the idea is that if rationality has been the determining factor of who gets to occupy a position of power, well, if that understanding of rationality has been defined with a bias towards men, well then predominantly men are going to be in dominant positions of power, right? Similarly with women. And again, we can expand upon this be more inclusive and intersectional and talk about how this also applies to race and socioeconomic status, to name a few, right? So when women and other marginalized groups are identified as being inherently irrational, typically because they are viewed as more emotional, right? These things are tied together. The idea is then that is able to justify their existing subordinated status, right? Oh, the reason we can't give women the right to vote or we can't allow women to occupy the presidency, right? The reason that women shouldn't be in those positions is because they're not mentally capable, right? Or their bodies are gonna get in the way somehow, right? That they're gonna be too emotional when they're menstruating, all, all the nonsense that I know you've heard before, right? That is still utilized today is based on this underlying association right, between being irrational and simply having emotions. And let's be really clear on what this means, is even for men, right? If, even if this were true, if it were true that men were inherently rational and that women were inherently irrational, and these things are tied to a lack of emotion, that means that men are inherently emotionless, which is basically our definition for what it means to be a sociopath, okay? So being able to have emotions is no small thing, right? It's a really important facet of being a functional human that is able to engage in the world in a successful way, right? So again, these associations don't really bode well for anyone when we're looking at them closely. Okay, so in uh, the next few um, passages, uh, I'm not gonna go through these because I think these are uh, easier for you to understand on your own. But the basic idea here is that uh, we're going to see a deeper dive into understanding how the notion of rationality has been constructed, right, in academia and primarily philosophy as the sort of founding of all higher education, right, that all of our concepts of knowledge and reason are going to be permeated with this bias. So they're going to walk you through examples of this and break down exactly how that works. And so I'm going to skip ahead. Here too, right, I'll let you look at this on your own with Phyllis Rooney, right, but the idea here is that even in, uh, not just in the direct sort of obviously explicitly misogynistic ways, but even in more masked forms, we see this continued bias uh, reflected in conceptions of reason. And so here, Phyllis Rooney is talking specifically about the use of sex metaphor, right, where you're not only associating irrationality with femininity, but also with a sexually objectified being, right? And so the idea here is that, um, you know, you see examples of someone being tricked into believing something false is described in the same metaphor as a man being sexually tempted by a woman, right? So the use of those things would create an implicit association or reinforce that association in our mind, right? That you can't trust either, right? That lies are like sexually tempting women or something like this, right? And again, we see this all the time, unfortunately emphasized a lot in um, 
uh, traditional Abrahamic religions, right? The, uh, and even in some Eastern traditions, right? The idea that if you want to pursue truth and knowledge, you have to abstain from engaging in, you know, quote unquote, sins of the flesh, right? That sex is synonymous with falsehood and trickery, right? And deceit and things that are, are bad, right? And, and uh, valued in that way. So you'll see her uh, explain this and again, go through some examples. Very interesting. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So with that, um, I wanna jump to, um, again, this focus on standpoint epistemology, because I feel like this is gonna be a little bit trickier for us to understand. And so I'm picking up here um, with Alison Jagger's paper, Love and Knowledge. Okay, so here again, she's talking about the historical split between emotion and reason, which we just discussed. But of course, because that is a socially constructed distinction, it's not absolute and it can be changed, right? As we've seen, it's based on a misunderstanding of what emotions are, right? Emotions are not unintentional, right? They're not dumb, they're not unspoken, they're not meaningless psychological feelings. They are intentional, right? They, they are intended towards something. And I think Nussbaum's categorization captures that intention well, right? You're intended towards some goal or plan, and the world either did or did not match that plan, right? M did or did not match that intention. Again, they're social con constructs because they're not instinctive in the sense that emotions are not going to be um, experienced in a range that is not parallel to the experience you have in the world. So for example, right, infants, are gonna have a much more narrow emotional range because the idea is that they've had far fewer experiences in the world, right? If emotions were purely instinctive, right? If they were innate in us, if they didn't require socializing or language, then infants should, would be capable of a full range of emotion, emotional states, right? just as much as someone who's lived a very full and complex life. But the idea is that we do not observe that, right? Infants do not have as wide a range of emotions, right? And I think we hopefully, <laughs> as we get older, try to broaden our, our range of emotional experience, right? Be able to experience nuanced emotions, right? More complex emotions as we get older, right? So the idea is that in this sense, again, it's not purely um, essentialistic, right? N naturalistic or determined by our biology. Okay. And again, right, the idea here is that emotions are more a reflection of active engagements in the world. Now, we often think that emotions are involuntary, but really that is the idea is that that is simply a reflection of being able to understand your own emotional state and thus respond accordingly, right? So the idea is that if you are experiencing anger, and you don't understand that anger, it might come across as if it's involuntary, but it's really just because you don't have any control over it because you don't know what it is. Whereas if you're, experience ang if you're experiencing anger and you understand it, you understand what it is in response to, and you understand why it is emerging, you are much more likely to be able to control that anger and thus experience it as a voluntary occurrence, right? You can choose to think about something else, right? But you're only able to make that choice because you have an understanding of what's going on, right? So the idea is that emotions are active engagements. It simply requires, you know, practice, being able to understand them as such, right? So partly, right, they are voluntary and partly involuntary because again, there is that response that comes up, but we can learn how to voluntarily respond differently to it, right? The problem is though, we're not always encouraged to learn how to do this. And so instead, right, they might feel involuntary because they are simply habitual responses that have been um, socialized in us through peer pressure, right? That we're um, habituated to respond to something in a particular way, even if that may not align with how we really feel. So you can think of this as like, Maybe you laughed at a joke that wasn't funny or was, you know, insensitive or something like this. And you're like, I, I didn't even think that was funny. Why did I laugh, right? It's sort of feels involuntary in that sense. But again, that comes from an, a lack of understanding or uh, uh, awareness in that present moment. And because of these things, right, because emotions don't happen for no reason, 
they're very important, right? Not just because having an emotional range and experience can give an intrinsic meaning to our life, but because emotions literally have helped us to evolve, right? They've played an instrumental role in human survival. We know that humans that are, have a greater capacity for emotional response are able to better navigate social environments. And as we know, that social element is key to our survival, right? And so again, the problem is going to be not just that we sort of put down emotions, but that we're actually taught to suppress them, which gives rise to a myth that we can actually exist in an emotionless state. And as we're gonna see next week again, this is gonna be really important in philosophy of science or in science in general, because we often think that the smartest people are those who are the most dispassionate, right? This has to do with um, notions of objectivity and objective truth, right? But again, the idea is that emotions are always present in investigations. We have the scientific method, which may filter out some idiosyncrasies of a particular person, but what they will never filter out, right, are generally accepted social values and observation, right? It will never change the way we understand or value, um, you know, studies being done by certain universities, right, over private citizens or, um, you know, kids in a local science fair. Right? It's always going to place a social value that is going to correlate expertise and authority to social standings, right? Similarly with scientific practice, right? If something is generally accepted in a scientific field, right, in how they engage in everyday life, that's not going to be covered by the scientific method because it will permeate every single aspect of an experiment, right? The control group as well as the, the variable in the test groups, right? Similarly with looking up a level in meta science, like what we count as evidence for certain things or the way we model certain facets of, um, of reality, right? So for example, we're going to see this is even gonna come up in um, interesting biases in favor of certain views of multi-theory or M-theory, multiverse theory, the idea that there are perhaps many different dimensions, right, um, or layers to reality that are intersecting, and we have different um, theories of how that might work. You could operate with something like string theory or quantum loop gravity. And the idea is that there actually is demonstrated in science an odd bias towards things that are modeled with concrete elements, like a string, right, is a thing, whereas a loop is this sort of like frilly, you know, we, um, disembodied energy that scientists don't really like that. Right? So we're going to see even weird sorts of biases in this sense, right? And the idea is that the scientific method cannot filter those out. And so because of that, not only is real science actually biased, it ends up being a reflection of a very particular bias, specifically biases that have been associated with masculinity, right, as we saw, being rational, not having an emotional state, right, not engaging in anything with any other part of the body except for the brain, right, these types of ideas. And because real science is going to be biased in this way, it will promote and protect its existing status quo, right, often for, um, again, because it's sort of self-justifying or just simply out of an appeal to tradition. Okay, so how does, how is science a reflection of male emotions? Well, according to Jagger, there are two kinds of emotions. Those that are going to be gendered more in favor of masculinity, which as we'll see, um, we unfortunately associate masculine emotions more with um, aggression, right? And confidence, uh, being firm, right? These types of emotional states, whereas we are gonna associate different types of emotions with women. So again, we see already a contradiction. First being masculine and rational means having no emotions, but really it means having certain emotions, right? So that sort of inconsistency there. But the two kinds of emotions that women will have, right, are they're going to, the idea is that they're going to be more um, diverse, although I, I think it would be more accurate to say that anyone could have these types of emotions, but women might be more greater, uh, 
they're socialized to more of an extent to demonstrate these, right? Men might feel, uh, you know, depending on their socialization, might feel um, some of these more internally, right? Where they haven't been encouraged to express them in society. Whereas women are encouraged to have emotion, right? But since they're only supposed to have certain emotions in certain situations, they have this external dichotomy. And that is between what are called hegemonic, right? So here again, uh, supporting and reformulating that um, conservative notion of what type of masculinity, right, is, is valued. And so these tend to be emotions that reflect the status quo in which males are dominant, right? So um, women perhaps engaging in um, more visceral sadness than men, right? So crying in public spaces, right, would be a sort of hegemonic emotion in that it sort of reinforces the idea that women are, you know, maybe weaker, they're not able to handle like a certain level of pressure in a certain situation without having a physical response, right, again, even though we cry for a reason, right, as opposed to outlaw emotions, which are considered unconventional, right, so an unconventional emotion would be instead of a woman crying when she gets upset, actually just being upset and being angry, right? That is not something that reflects the status quo, right? Men are prohibited or are permitted in public to express anger. Women are not, right? And so these are the emotions that are discouraged. But as a result, these are going to be the emotions that feminist epistemologists want to uphold, right? These are the ones that we should look to to deal with the problems that we've seen result from traditional notions of epistemology, which separate reason and emotion, right? And so unfortunately, because women are socialized more to experience outlaw emotions, even though they are then punished for doing that in the wrong uh, situation, women tend to be uh, better at reflecting on their emotions, right? Again, this is, is not to say anything negative about men. Men haven't been socialized in general to the same degree as women to have a you know greater emotional vocabulary to be able to identify different emotions and the reason that women are often encouraged to do that it's believed is so that they can better control them right so again being cognizant of something leads to being able to controlling it so the idea here is well how can we utilize these emotions that have been discouraged primarily in women but also in certain men, right? So black men not able to get angry in public either, right? So again, that's we, we need to acknowledge the intersectionality here. But the idea is maybe we need to rethink the relationship between knowledge and emotion and actually allow emotion, again, to play a role in what gives us an account of what knowledge is, right? So the idea here is feminist epistemologists are gonna be moving to a mo new model of knowledge, which constructs knowledge as having both reason and emotion as being mutually constitutive, right? So they can't exist apart from each other, right? You don't have emotions for no reason. And a lot of it will also suggest that when you engage in rational discourse, that will often prompt emotional responses, right? It's hard to, to learn something, to, to gain a new piece of information and know it without it subsequently causing an emotional reaction, right? Whether that emotional reaction is delight, right? The joy of learning something new or the horror, right? Of learning something, um, again, probably because it's at odds with what you wish the world was like. And the idea here is then we can acknowledge that both are equally valuable and necessary for obtaining knowledge, right? So this helps when we realize that an emotion is a conceptual abstraction from a complex process of human activity that also involves intentional acting, situational sensation, and cognitive evaluation, right? And so the idea here is that hopefully we can take away the hierarchy that has previously existed with reason being dominant over emotion. All right, so this leads us to standpoint theory in particular as one of many different feminist epistemologies that have emerged. And standpoint theory is not only going to take aim at the um, split between reason and emotion, but also how that split has led to a misunderstanding and use of the term objective. And so here I have um, just some basic descriptions of what the difference is between 
objectivity, subjectivity, and relativism. And these are important because we can think of these as like different degrees of corresponding with the world, which have implications on what we can know. So for example, if you believe in traditional notions of objectivity, then you think that some forms of truths are what we might call mind independent, right? So if you say the earth is round, right? Then you can say, okay, is that true objectively or subjectively? Subjectively would mean that it would be mind dependent. Its truth would depend on, right, something internal to the agent. That's when it's open to bias, right? Whereas if it was objectively true, the idea is that that truth comes from the world, right? Not our minds. And so is not subject to that sort of bias. So the idea here is that if you say that the world is round and that that is an objective truth, well, then it doesn't matter that some people think that the earth is flat, right? And it doesn't matter that some people believe that the earth is round. It is either round or flat, irregardless of what people think, right? So that's objective truth. Whereas subjective truth, again, would say that, no, it's truth or falsity just depends on what someone believes, right? So this, I think, is better captured by statements of opinion, right? So like if I say chocolate is the best flavor ice cream, that could be true for me and false for you, and it's not like one of us is correct and the other one is incorrect, right? Because the truth literally depends upon who is making that judgment. Relativism is like taking the view of subjectivity to the extreme. There you're saying that everything is subjective, right? That there are only things, the only type of truth is truth dependent on a mind, right? And this is really problematic because this makes knowledge and its use in the world really inconsistent, right? If I can just believe whatever I want and you can believe whatever you want and we're both right, how do we negotiate and move forward as a group, right? So with regard to traditional conceptions of knowledge, sex and gender, even in discussing notions of subjectivity and relativism, were assumed to be irrelevant to what someone could know, right? So the idea is whether or not you liked something, even if you thought that was subjective, there was never a discussion of what role sex or gender played in your personal circumstances, right? And that's going to be a big problem. And of course, as we can gather, this is also going to be true with other inter intersectional identities, primarily race and socioeconomic status. So to compare, right, traditional epistemologists have had this problem where they don't take the sex or gender of the knower into account, right, at all, whether we're talking about objectivism, subjectivity, relative, whatever it is. The sex, gender, race, socioeconomic status, none of that mattered in theory to whether or not you could know something. Whereas standpoint theorists and feminist epistemologists are going to say that that stuff absolutely matters. And so they're going to give us a different, different conception of kinds of knowers. So the atomistic knower is someone who is individualistic, right? Generic, interchangeable, doesn't rely on other people to get to know something, right? You're just sort of judging it on, on that individual, right? It denies the uh, epistemic relevance of aspects of your identity and social locations. Again, it makes gender e totally irrelevant to what you can know and ignores more complex forms of knowledge, which include emotional responses, right? But what's more important is that it also ignores the, ignores the social interactions with, which make knowledge possible, right? We very rarely come to know something just on our own. Most of our knowledge comes from trust in certain communities, right, as experts um, and sources of authoritative testimony. So the kinds of knowers that we see in feminist epistemology are not atomistic in this way. They are entirely situated. And they can be situated in one of three ways. You can focus on the individual, right, which is known as differentiated situational knowers, interactive or relational situated knowers, which here has a relationship between an individual and an institution, right? So that's sort of one to a larger group. Or you can have communal more as a web right, where individuals can have knowledge, but it's never going to be independent from that larger community in which they're a part. So different ideas, we don't need to focus too much on those. But the idea is that with any one of these, you are going to be taking into account the specific situation of the person in all of the intersectional ways that we've been talking about, and that that 
those aspects of our, their identity will have a direct correlation to what they can know and probably more importantly what they possibly cannot know so this is a sort of a radical idea right so the idea is that if your identity will determine your knowledge it's not only going to say what you will have greater knowledge on but also what you maybe are less knowledgeable about okay and so the idea is that there are going to be some experiences which cannot be accessed based on one's sexed body and gender roles in society and i'm going to lay out how this works right but the basic underlying principle is that this creates a sort of relativism that can't be totally avoided right we want to make sure that we're taking the subjective experience of each individual into account right so we're kind of abandoning the traditional notion of objectivity but we don't want it to collapse into complete relativism because again we need knowledge to be able to work for us in an instrumental way so standpoint theory is going to try to navigate this how can we account for the subjective experience while avoiding relativism entirely so the idea here is to talk about us again as sorts of they sort of have to generalize in this way to um to sort of paint this picture that we can sort of group people together by their various intersectional identities and that those aspects of their identity will create an overall status that they probably have or location in society right in terms of sex gender sexuality race religious affiliation socioeconomic status right all of these things and that that will have a direct correlation to what their epistemic position is in other words how what position they're in to come to know something or to be the most justified right or considered to have the best perspective on an issue and the idea with standpoint theory is that these two things are in an inverse relationship with one another meaning that the greater privilege you have in society the less epistemic privilege you have about those correlative areas now this doesn't work for everything right this doesn't mean that if you're the most marginalized you're the most brilliant right what it has to do with certain domains of knowledge so let's take um, issues of sexual orientation for example right the basic idea here is uh, using this these diagrams on the right is that the greater socioeconomic privilege you have so in terms of sexual orientation we know that we live in a heteronormative society right so the default sort of um, presumed sexual orientation of everyone is heterosexual right which has resulted in the marginalization and oppression of people who do not identify as heterosexual so let's take the a simple example here to to weed out all the other potential intersectional identities let's say we are dealing with two men they in this case both happen to be caucasian they both happen to be christian they both happen to come from uh, middle class families in the midwest the only difference for the sake of this example is that one of these men identifies as heterosexual and the other man identifies as homosexual okay now because of our heteronormative society we know that the heterosexual male is likely again right this we're making a generalization here but is likely to experience gradius, greater socioeconomic privilege right because throughout our history gay men have been very much punished right not just in their personal lives but also in their professional lives and by the law right for being gay okay so the idea here is that the greater socioeconomic privilege you have in one particular domain the less epistemic privilege you have so what that means is that the straight male in this case will know less about sexuality and sexual orientation than the gay man right so the gay man having experienced less socioeconomic privilege again making a generalization that means that they will have greater epistemic privilege in this domain right so that means that the gay man will know more or is likely to know more about sexuality and sexual orientation than the straight man so why is this why is there an inverse relationship between socioeconomic privilege and epistemic privilege 
In standpoint theory, this is called dual vision. The idea here is that when you experience oppression and marginalization in a society, you actually get to see things through both your own perspective, right, of marginalization and oppression, but you're also able to understand the world through the dominant perspective, meaning that not only do you know what it's like to be gay through your own experience, but you also know what it's like to be straight because that is the, the sort of re sexual relationship that has been perpetuated throughout your entire life. You've probably seen many more instances and representations of straight couples and relationships, of straight men, uh, you know, how, how those men are supposed to, supposed to behave, right? Uh, those sort of social norms. You maybe have been presumed most of your life to be straight, right? People might make that default presumption of you. Um, you might have even had to pretend to be straight at certain points in your life, right? So the idea here is that because you experience both your own oppression and are forced to see the default heteronormative expectations, you have this double vision, right? You're able to see things through both lenses, and so you have greater epistemic privilege. And so you can take this example and expand it out to, to any other of the intersectional identities, right? So if you are a man, right, if you're socialized as a man, a cisgendered man, you, according to this theory, would know less about, say, gender inequality, since that has targeted historically women, right? And then women would thus know more about gender inequality as the subjects of that marginalization. Now, the important thing about this is that it, again, this is not a priori knowledge, right? It doesn't just come because you have a certain identity. And not only does it only come through your experiences, but more importantly, it can only come through a resistance to that oppression. So if a woman were to have internalized the oppression that she has experienced in the world, right? Messages that she should be submissive, right? To men that she should only exist in the home as a mother or wife, right? That, that she has no value outside of that. If she has internalized those messages and not resisted them, she would then not have that epistemic privilege, right? So again, uh, we can think back to realistic examples of how this comes into impact our lives. So if you remember back when um, the Senate was, you know, debating whether or not the Affordable Care Act should cover birth control. Well, as you know, most birth control um, is targeted towards females, right? So we have very few, um, you know, male forms of birth control outside of uh, prophylactics. And so the onus historically has been on women, right? And specifically the effects have predominantly targeted women, right, and their bodies. So when you look at the Senate's hearings when they're debating whether or not birth control should be covered under the Affordable Care Act, it's not an accident that that panel was composed of entirely white men, right? There was not a single woman on that forum that could contribute to the conversation of whether or not birth control should be covered. And then the one woman who did speak up, she happened to be in, uh, in the audience and she asked a question, was then later berated right, for being a slut, right, the only reason she could possibly want birth control is so that she could go and sleep with a bunch of people, right, and not get pregnant, and like horrible, all of the horrible, right, anti-female, um, you know, misogynistic things we've, we've come to be familiar with, right, but the idea is that not only should women have been represented, but they, they probably should have been primarily represented since they are the ones who are primarily affected by this, right, and if you know anything about birth control, you know that it's not just used to prevent unwanted pregnancies or to protect against the transmission of STDs, right? Birth control can be used to um, deal with uh, ovarian cysts, right? Amongst other uh, biological issues that women deal with, sometimes birth control is the, the most um, affordable and effective means of dealing with those, those issues, right? So again, the idea is, well, maybe women might know more about this thing than men do, right? Same thing with why we don't just want a bunch of white people together when we're talking about racial issues, right? That maybe people of color, people who experience the effects of racism, probably know more about it, right? 
But the idea is that, again, this doesn't just come automatically, it's something that comes through resistance. And so since everyone is always going to have these biases, right, we're sort of getting away from the idea of truly being objective, that we want to recognize some of these biases as good, right, leading more towards the truth, whereas others are going to be identified as bad, leading more towards falsity. And we'll see more of that next week in philosophy of science. Right, but the idea here is again, maybe we not only need to move away from the notion of object objectivity, but so we don't collapse into relativism, we just maybe need to redefine objectivity. So here we have again, three different notions of different ways to redefine objectivity. They sort of correlate to those different views of situated knowers with our author this week looking at strong objectivity, right? So the idea is, instead of thinking of objectivity as something that is true in the world, independent of any mind, as it was traditionally, we can understand it in terms of being something that the community of those with epistemic privilege on that matter have come to a consensus on, right? So if we're looking at, you know, what is the truth about you know, the experience of, of black men in America, well, black men are going to be in the best privilege position to give us the answer to that. And that the consensus that they come to as a group, right, if a consensus is able to be made, right, is gonna be the closest thing to objectivity we can get. But what's great about that is that it not only avoids relativism, but it leaves open the possibility of revitalizing and updating our understandings of truth, right, which in science we always want to do. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some potential problems with standpoint theory, right? I'm going to list a lot of them here for you to take a look at, but I think the biggest one comes from the fact that it's really difficult to account for intersectionality in the sense that you might have someone who in some cases has great socioeconomic privilege, but in other cases has very little socioeconomic privilege. And so what does that mean for their epistemic privilege? Does it cancel out, right? Does it, you know, it, it's, it can be very hard to track because people do not fall into a single category, right? That we have these very complex identities. Um, other issues have to do with the fact that, you know, this might only work with certain types of knowledge, right? Maybe it doesn't work for scientific knowledge. Although, um, you know, we might want to say that, you know, your bias in one sense doesn't mean that you can't do good theorizing in another sense. So for example, you know, we all think of Albert Einstein, right, as this, uh, you know, paradigmatic figure in science who gave us these amazing theories of relativity. And we sort of overlook the relationship that he had with his wife. And I encourage you to go look at the, he actually wrote up very interesting and sexist rules for her to follow in their relationship. And, you know, the idea is we think that even if he was misogynistic in those ways, right, had that greater socioeconomic privilege, well, that didn't necessarily transfer into less knowledge in, in, in this other case, right? So, you know, how do we account for that? Also, he was persecuted as a Jew, right? So there are all these different ways in which, we, you know, how do we account for this theory when it comes to the experts throughout history? All right, and so the final point that I'll leave you with is that standpoint theorists, again, are one particular type of feminist epistemology, which are aiming to redefine rationality and objectivity so that not only it includes um, emotion in a positive way, but can help actually be useful in overcoming the systemic bias that has afflicted you know, non-hegemonic males because they have been presumed to be less intelligent, more irrational or something like this.